Picture this. Orlando City's fans this off season. I'm out! I quit! Whose kidneys are these? Orlando City's fans after they announced Pereja, Peria, and Lo Rea. You son of a bitch! I'm in! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Orlando Soccer Show. My name is Austin David. With me is Gavin Eubank. And yes, you sons of bitches, we're back in it. Uh, we're here to talk about the week that was, and by week, I mean uh, last Monday to this Monday. Uh, in the week that was for Orlando City, lots of news dropping. We figured, you know what? It's the off season, sure, but we'll we'll come back and talk about it, and then we'll talk about some other stuff that's going on in the Orlando area, in terms of soccer. So, Gavin, first off, how you doing? I'm doing well. You know, you said they got us back in, and let's be honest, we we've gone through a lot over the last uh, five six years. We just hate ourselves at this point. We can't not be in it. No, no. See, here's the thing. Uh, I, I'm not saying they brought us back in. We never left. We've just been yeah. here. We've been passively, aggressively standing in the corner with our arms crossed. <laughs> just like a disappointed dad, just shaking their head like, nope, this isn't yeah. going to do it for me. Yeah, exactly. Nope. <laughs> uh, just like every youth team's nightmare. Yeah, pretty much. It's, you know, it's just one of those things. It's kind of, we're like, we're chasing the dragon essentially of just badness and, we can't get enough of it as much as we have it. Well, hey, the the Orlando City has made some steps in order to combat that fact. They have hired some people and brought in some players, and we're going to take it all down and break it all down and, uh, well, figure out what this means for the team and if they can be successful next year. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. And it, we should preface this by saying we've seen this exact story play out before. So I will say that Orlando City is still bad until they're not bad anymore. I would uh, I would agree with that. I think mm -hmm. the biggest thing for this team right now, and I've been telling people all over the media, I've been telling people like everyone that's asked me, okay, so what does this coach mean? What you know, what's going to happen with Orlando City now? And I tell them like this means nothing until you change something on the field, mm -hmm. because every single change that they have made has been trying to benefit the club and it ends up not and then they go back to the drawing board so yeah it can look good from day one they can say the right things but ultimately your performance on the pitch how many games you win will determine your tenure here in Orlando now with that who did they hire well just the former MLS coach of the year Oscar Pareja can you roll your R's Gavin uh, let's stop trying and just move on because that was absolutely atrocious uh, well Gavin you're going to have a hard time pronouncing half the people on this team and their names but we're going to move on Oscar Pareja coach of the year back in 2016 something like that probably 16 he is a winning coach not only that but he is a former MLS player we've been down this road before but here's where he's different he is actually one coach of the year uh, Jason Christ, he won an MLS championship, which Oscar Pereja has still not done yet, but looks to do so for Orlando, uh, maybe a few years down the road. I say Pereja does have a supporter shield, though. So He does have a supporter shield, and he does have a U.S. Open Cup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no MLS championship, but he has two of the three. But the big thing with Oscar, youth development. And within a week of him being here, he is already, well, not he, but his his tenure has already started off with getting a few young players which we'll get into a little bit later but focusing on Pareja he had a half hour press conference that I went to last Monday the The only question I was able to ask him was in fact about his youth development and the culture that he and Luis Muzi were trying to build uh, for those who don't know Luis Muzi and Oscar Pareja worked together at FC Dallas from 2014 to 2018 where Pareja left to go to Jolos in Mexico, which is Tijuana. Uh, he was there for just, just over a year and then mutually parted ways to come to Orlando to take the job with his former assistant of soccer operations, Luis Muzi, now the chief of soccer operations. So it's similar. It's a little bit of the same and maybe a little bit more of a comfort zone for Oscar. You know, he, he tried his hand at Mexican soccer. It didn't quite work out. And now he's back in MLS where he found a lot of success with Dallas, but now in Florida. The thing with his tenure in Dallas was 
all of the youth development that they had, I mean, you can see the pipeline that Dallas has created for some of these players. I mean, Reggie Cannon, Paxton Pomichol, Weston McKinney, just to name a few. But a lot of these guys are playing very high level and getting recruited from overseas, McKinney being one of the more specific ones. Say Jesse Gonzalez, too, the goalkeeper, uh, the Mexican international. Yes, yes. Again, one of many, many names that I could name at this point in time to come out of the Dallas pipeline. Now, when I asked Pereja about Orlando and the culture that he was trying to build, uh, which, by the way, you can read more about this on MLSsoccer.com. Just search my name as the author, and uh, you can read all about exactly what he said. But I'll give you a cliff notes just because I'm very nice. <laughs> was, that, was that enough of a shameless plug? Yeah, Adam? I was going to say a very shameless plug. Oh, so shameless. Not not shameful at all. But basically, Muzi and Pereja, they're on the exact same page, which is important. And I think one of the, one of the key things I... I heard when Muzi was talking about he said I think it's extremely positive to have someone here who shares the same values as I do now if you read into that a little bit you can say oh well James O'Connor didn't share the same values as Luis Muzi that's obviously what he's saying right Uh, again if you read too much into it maybe It, it might just be that he's saying well yeah Pereja I've known him I know exactly what he's about which is why I brought him in and the reports are, from, from a lot of people that I've heard, Pareja was the one and only. Like, they didn't really interview anybody else. He was their guy. What Muzi was saying at the very beginning of the press conference, he said, you know, when we were trying to look for a coach, I kept racking my brain. I kept trying to figure out, you know, who was the best guy? And every time I came back to Oscar. Every time. And that is why he is sitting in the highest of che- seats for Orlando City right now is because, well, it's Luis Muzi's guy. And we said it probably months ago. They were going to hire somebody that was Luis Muzi's guy. And this is, I mean, you couldn't get much more of his guy than Oscar Pereja. Yeah, I mean, you're you're talking about a relationship that goes back years, obviously working together at FC Dallas. And like you said, the parallels between the things that Oscar Pereja says and the things that he says he believes in are very, very similar and very... Um, the, the same talking points that Luis Muzi uh, puts out there. So it, it, it in no ways is it hard to see where the connection is here. You know, as far as Perea as the head coach, I mean, it's a good hire. It's a great hire. It's very well, res- you know, it's a guy that's well respected around Major League Soccer and brings a lot of credibility to Orlando in, a, in an office that, quite frankly, doesn't have very much of that, if any at all. Um, but at the same time, you know, like we prefaced this before, we believe uh, you and I had said a lot of the same things when Jason Christ was hired. Is you know this is a guy with an MLS pedigree. He's been there. He's won that. He's built success in a place that you wouldn't otherwise expect it in Major League Soccer. And then we saw how that turned out. So obviously, until the um, results are there, until they start playing games, until Orlando City starts winning games, it's tough to say um, just how good this can be because ultimately. We haven't seen it. We we don't know what that success looks like here. But for the most part, this is exactly the kind of hire that Orlando City needs because of, like you said, the youth development, the ability that they are going to have with that new training facility to put everybody in one roof, to to make everybody top to bottom a part of the same team that Luis Muzi keeps talking about. And ultimately, when you look at the club that those two ran together in Dallas, Orlando has is is very much along the same parallels as it, in that they're going to spend money here and there where they see fit. But this is not a club that's obviously going to spend money that we know, like Atlanta, LAFC, those those clubs of that nature. So they're building a business model that is exactly identical to FC Dallas. And like you said, look how just well they have been over the last five, six, seven years in Major League Soccer. Right. Uh, I do want to read a quote from Pereja when you know when I asked him that that question. He he had a very long winded answer, by the way. <laughs> he said, "Here's the long quote that I'll read you. The best experience that I had in this country since I started playing here in 1998 was having the vision of believing in the American player. In 1998, when I came here, I found a link that was just starting in my first in the first two years." And that players were received 
from clubs were coming from college, whether they were international players, players who came from abroad, or the players who came from college. That was a culture that I respect too much. I think there is a great value that Major League Soccer has in having players that can go study and get their careers, and after that, he can become a professional soccer player being educated. That doesn't happen too much in many other countries. After that, I started thinking why MLS clubs don't have academies like the way we did growing up in our countries. And then he went on to say, when I see Orlando with that potential, that inspired me. And to be honest, I would like to be a part of that. Developing players in Orlando and seeing the grounds growing here, as well as what happened in Dallas or in any other MLS team, and many other clubs are doing it very well. I think Orlando is doing it very well because you have Benji Michel, you have Santiago Patino, you have players that have been a part of this cl- culture, and it's fantastic. Why not just be the city that can keep growing in that area? I'm inspired to come here because that's one of the things that we have done before. And he also added, without forgetting that we need to get results. And it probably we all feel the urgency to get results, and I don't escape that responsibility. So, in a nutshell, he says, uh, I love MLS. I love the way it runs. I love the fact that players can go to college. I love that we can have academies now because that's what we did in Dallas. Now that we're, we, ha- we have it here, he says we already see it in Orlando. It's a project, project that's already been developed over the last four to five years. Uh, he also gave credit to a lot of the people. He said that everyone who has been a part of this club, whether it becomes coaches or otherwise, have all been a part of the framework that leads us up to now. So he's giving credit to Adrian. He's giving credit to Jason, James, uh, and even Bobby Murphy. You know, these are guys that laid the framework to what he is now inheriting. And I think that's kind of what he tried to say is, yes, I understand that this is a a project, uh, but it's already under construction. It's already been under construction for the past couple of years. And he's just very excited. Yeah, there was a point in there that you mentioned um, about the young kids and the the home groups coming up and building that culture. I think that's an interesting thought that I kind of hadn't thought about is when you have all the, you know, like a Dallas where you have so many homegrown players, you're talking about kids that game up through the system together, have played together. They've you know spent all this time together and they have the ability to instill that chemistry and that camaraderie into the first team. Whereas Orlando's never really had the ability to do that over the last five years, obviously because they've only had so many few homegrowns. They have, they haven't really produced anything from their Academy all these players are coming in from internationally all over the place. You know, it's not, you know, when you have so many moving parts coming in and out, it's hard to develop that. But when you have these guys that are already there, that know the club, that know the city, that know the fans, I feel like that instills a little bit more into what you're trying to build as a culture. So that's certainly something that's kind of interesting to think about with the the homegrown aspect to it. I would agree with that. Uh, again, the homegrown aspect of things we'll talk about a little bit later because they've already made a signing first week in when it comes to homegrown players. This this has been a player that has been in the works for a while now, mm-hmm. so it really doesn't come as, as much surprise to, to me, at least, because I've kind of known for the last like three years, basically since he went to college, that they wanted him pretty badly, but they didn't think he was quite ready yet. Like There were a lot of doubters within his... his like coaching circles and you know jason was involved uh so a lot lot to go through in in that respect but it's yeah he he um this is gonna sound really corny but he won the press conference which you can say literally about every single coach that orlando city has ever hired they won their press conference but at the end of the day that does not matter it matters what you do he is he has made big big aspirations when it comes to this club he wants the club to make the playoffs he wants the uh academies to develop you know future talents he wants to to do a lot with this club so does Luis Muzi and this is where their both of their tenures technically really start to go under a microscope because this is Luis Muzi's first hire as chief of soccer operations at Orlando City and so whatever happens here falls on both their shoulders if they win they can take all the credit and if they lose they have to shoulder the burden yeah i mean absolutely it's it's one of the things where unless things go off the rails i mean i think Muzi's, you know 
this is Orlando City. No one's job is safe. But, you know, unless things go off the rails, this is certainly going to be Muzi's year, and it's going to be his responsibility up front mostly, obviously because Pereja isn't here, and the two players that they have signed this week are people that have already been on the radar for the club for a while, um, long before he got here. But it's, like you said, winning a press conference isn't going to get you three points against RSL on you know, on opening day or Colorado or, you know, anybody else that they play this year. It's it's down to, you know, he got the big piece out of the way. He got the head coach, and that's certainly a huge part of building your team. But now the rest has to get back to, all right, what's happening on the field? Who's going to be there and who's going to be important to us off the sideline? All right, let's move on. We talked about Pareja, the coach. Mm. We'll get to the new signings in a minute because uh, one of their names is very uh, – <laughs> close to that let's talk about the players that are no longer with orlando city mm. the the club kind of making it official today they basically said uh their goodbyes to nine players officially they posted thank yous to lamine sane cam lindley will johnson adam grinwis shane o'neill carlos asquez sasha Clustion, and dylan powers and then a special thank you video to Christian Higita. A couple of surprises in there, I guess. I mean, no one's surprised Sasha Kleshin is not coming back. He's apparently about to sign a deal with the, or I guess he did sign. Um, Baruch Galoto did confirm that to the media that he's he signed Sasha Kleshin. Um Christian Higita, that's an end of an era. I mean, you know, what else can you say? The guy's been with the club five years, only last player left from the inaugural roster. It's kind of a sad day in, in that respect. Will Johnson, I, got, I mean, I honestly, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm a little surprised he's not coming back. I mean, he's been here three years, so maybe it's just he's not really in the plans anymore. Obviously, he was only here not by choice this past season, so it's probably fair to say that that, that tenure might have been cut a little bit shorter if Luis Muzi had the ability to. Lamont Sané also probably not really a surprise there, I'd with as much as Sorry, he was making, hold on, hold on, let me and Sane. On. Yes, there you go. <laughs> as much as he was making last season, I don't think that he was going to take a big pay cut, which is really the only thing that would have brought him back to Orlando City. So, um, other than that, the rest of those guys, yeah, that's that's the weight that they're trying to cut. Yeah, and uh, the Will Johnson was probably one of the the more interesting tenures with Orlando. Oh, yeah, there was a lot of mixed reactions on Twitter. Yeah, a lot of fans were happy to see him go. A lot of fans weren't. Um, personally, his stats say that he's one of the best defensive midfielders that Orlando City's ever had. Yeah. And uh, numbers don't necessarily lie. Yeah, I or mean, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult because a lot of his character and – Obviously, some of the things that have happened off the field have really clouded um, a lot of people's ability to just take him as a, you know, for what he is as a player. And arguably for most of this year, he was one of the most important, most valuable players to Orlando City, you know, for a team that was not obviously very good for a lot of the for a lot of the year in the midfield. He just did so much. He's he was so versatile, not just this season, but obviously throughout his tenure with Orlando, you know. You can ask him to play right back, and he would, he would you know step in and do a, a fantastic job. He'd play attacking midfielder, defensive midfielder, yep. left wing, right wing, wherever you put him, he was there. Um, yeah, and he he had he, the he effort. Played, he played almost every position in the midfield. Yeah, and uh, at at some point, I feel like he played center back. But the thing, <laughs> yeah, with that does Will, sound right. The thing with Will is that people will only remember him for the negative because the negative mm-hmm. sticks out more than the positive, especially when it's so prevalent. The mm-hmm. negative being the, the Wayne Rooney uh, goal that Luciano Acosta scored, uh, you know, when Will was tackled, people will never forgive him for that. Yeah. Uh, and then the, uh, the other issues off the field, you know, I don't want to get into too much detail, but yeah, right. Which is unfortunate that. in a scenario like that, because things like that do happen a lot. Um, not that to belittle the real, things that obviously right. occur it's, in the again, it, the, situation the, but in this right. scenario it's been pretty widespread spread belief that what was portrayed um 
when the arrest and, and everything went down is not exactly what had happened. And it's unfortunate because it really did put a black a black eye on his time here. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing, you know, we can only tell you, we can only sit here and say, yeah, as a player, he was actually very good. But at the same time, it's not going to change a lot of opinions if people choose not to see past that because of what um, the incident, what the charges of the incidents were. Again, yeah, True and it's false. a very touchy subject, which is is why I, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Right. We're strictly going to talk about the numbers. Mm-hmm. And by the way, uh, he had sixty nine career starts for Orlando City. Yeah, so I mean, play. player of player of the decade, right? Yeah, uh, official stats in his time combined with league appearances and U.S. Open Cup appearances: eighty appearances, seventy two starts, four goals, five assists. Christian Aguita. 108 appearances, 89 starts, 6 goals, 9 assists. With 39 yellow cards. Yeah, it's very close. I mean, uh, God. Oh, by the way, Christian Aguita, 39 yellows uh, and only 2 reds. I think the thing that's that's going to get us killed for even saying that it's close is because Christian Aguita was such a nice guy. <laughs> Everyone loved him. If you know Will as a person, he is one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. But <laughs> statistically speaking, Christian had a lot of injury issues, which caused him to miss time. He probably would have passed a hundred appearances earlier in you know earlier last year uh, if he hadn't missed time. He missed a lot of time actually this year with injury. He probably would have tapped like every other. Every other month, it was a hamstring or a calf or a quad or something that kept him out. This is yeah. this the team in a nutshell, isn't it? It's yeah. just all hamstring injuries. It's the, like, if you put together the all hamstring injury team for Orlando City, it would look pretty good. <laughs> I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah, it would. So, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the Christian Aguita and Will Johnson thing, arguably you know, one, some of the better midfielders in Orlando City history. Uh, when it comes to strictly just stats, you know, out of out of the eighty appearances that Will had, he started seventy two of those, which means he didn't start eight games. You know, Christian started eighty nine games out of one hundred and eight, so there were there were a lot more games that he came off the bench, but that doesn't necessarily say that he wasn't effective in his time on the pitch. It just it wasn't. He, you know, Will was just he he could run all ninety minutes without getting tired. He wouldn't have to come off. Mm-hmm. You know, he played almost every single minute of every single game that he was in, and it just so happens that DC United game, it, you know, his legs gave out kind of towards the end. But every other game you watched him, he was going like he was still minute one. Mm-hmm. And and again, people say, "Oh, well, I could hustle too." It's not that simple it's really not that simple yeah you can hustle but to be able to give that 90 plus minutes every game when maybe you're down by two and your team's not in it or you're up by three and it's like all right well i don't have to put the effort in because we've got the victory in the bag it's it's not giving up on loose balls it's fighting for every for every tackle for every ball it's the the little things it maybe is not the prettiest He's maybe not the prettiest tactical player, but he does so many little things that any young player, young kid looking up to, and you can you can say, like, that's the kind of player you should be. You should be putting everything into everything you do on the field. And yeah, he mm-hmm. shows a little passion at times and maybe that upsets people, but that's Will Johnson and that you know, that is the controversial figure that he is. Yeah. Uh, moving on from all of that, I think it's about that that time just to continue. Let's go ahead and talk about the new signings. Out with the old, in with the new. Mm-hmm. Two new faces, technically one new face, one old face that's returning after uh, three years away. It is... Well, let's start with the new face then, shall we? We talked about Pereira and Pareja. Pereira being the current attacking midfielder that is the designated player and Pareja being the head coach of Orlando City now we have Andres Pereja yep 
19 year old or yeah 19 year old defensive Columbian. midfielder Colombian yep. so you you trade one yep. somewhat veteran defensive midfielder to another defensive midfielder from Colombia uh not from the same clubs uh Perea is from Atletico Nacional he is on loan for this season with the option to purchase so if he does have a good season the club may end up taking that option and keeping him on he was born in Tampa he holds U.S. citizenship so that should be that that alone should be enough to give him yeah he is a U.S. and Colombian so that's that's another big benefit a six foot midfielder born in 2000 god that makes me feel old this is Orlando's first official player born in the this century isn't it uh, I want to say yes. I had that thought earlier. I was born I in 2000, really yeah. I want to hate myself. Why? Because you feel old? A little bit. Yeah. How do you think I feel? <laughs> I'm older than you. Yeah. A couple of years. Ugh, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm closer to 30 than 20. <laughs> That's true. Just saying. Ooh. All right. Well, uh, Andres Perea. He has made appearances for the U-17 and U-19 teams for Colombia, and he's played in the U-17 and U-19 World Cups. He was born in Tampa, but spent most of his life with Atletico Nacional. He joined the club at the age of six. He won youth national title of Colombia back in 2013. He has played a lot and played uh, a lot of good games for Atletico Nacional recently. So now him coming into the club, uh, it gives something for Pareja to work with in terms of a, a, a budding young talent from South America, which I would say that's probably just right up his alley. Yeah, you know, that was one of the things he was really good at in Dallas with guys like Fabio Castillo. He really gets the most out of them. And I brought this up the other day and I wrote about it at OSJ is, you know, for guys like a Jose Colman, you know, if he sticks around this year, and you know, obviously Perea and Luis Muzi talk about attacking minded and you know creating that, he's a guy kind of that could seem like maybe he fits right in with the plans there. You know, obviously we really don't know what he looks like for Orlando City and Major League Soccer, but he could have a pretty good shot that he hasn't had in the past to break his way into the lineup now. And like you said, with a guy like Perea as well. So moving on from Perea, who will uh, hopefully arrive in Orlando soon, we move on to another Orlando-related player. He's come up from the academy, went to North Carolina State, and has now signed a homegrown contract with Orlando City. It is David Loera, multi-year homegrown contract, becoming a sixth homegrown player in club history. Gavin, can you name the other five? Tommy Redding, Harrison Heath, Tyler Turner. Benji Michel mm-hmm. and Mason Stadura. Yes. Were you reading that off the sheet? No, I'm just so oh, enriched you, you in remember Orlando it. City history. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. What's Gavin's not telling you is we could not figure out if Harrison Heath was actually a homegrown player. We were debating back and forth. If How did you not know that? That was like one of the dumbest like homegrown signings ever. Gavin. Because he's not a homegrown player. Yes. But he wasn't originally signed as a homegrown. Yeah. He was signed just to the roster and then moved to a homegrown without really announcing it. They they never really made an official announcement, I don't think. It's hard to remember. I remember I remember actually breaking that news that Harrison Heath was going to be a homegrown player, and that was back in 2014. And then I remember the reaction to it was like, oh, my God, thank God. You know, thank God he's not going to be a normal roster spot. He's going to be a homegrown. <laughs> and then I, I think that didn't happen for the first couple months of the year and then like mid season it changed all of a sudden. It was really weird. Yeah, when he got invited to the homegrown game and everyone was like, "Wait, what? What? You how is he a homegrown?" <laughs> but like, yep, he's signed as a homegrown. Uh, you know, he he spent more time in Texas with the academies out there than Orlando's, but yeah, sure. Yeah. Homegrown. Him and Tyler Turner. I mean, listen, two of the least Tyler's- homegrown players in MLS history. Tyler is from Connecticut. He spent some time at IMG Academy. The only reason he was allowed to sign a homegrown contract with Orlando is because they were new and they needed somebody. And that he was there. He was right there for them to take. There's no team in Connecticut. 
So, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Tommy Redding was the first real homegrown player signed. Mm-hmm. He then won. Mason. You know what? Tommy, technically, is not a real homegrown either because he never played for Orlando City's Academy. <laughs> he played in Orlando, sure. But I don't think he ever... I talked to his dad about this once before, and I, I'm pretty sure he told me he never played for Orlando City's Academy. He just played in Orlando. But then they came to him and said, hey, we want to sign you to a homegrown contract, and MLS is going to let us do it. So you want to do it? And they're like, okay. So technically, Mason Stadahar is the first actual player who played for Orlando City's Academy to then move up and sign a homegrown deal at 17 back in 2015. He's had a long journey. Yeah. Back to David Loera because we got way off target. Mason, who, by the way, did sign a new contract, which I don't think we've talked about since we uh, yes. last recorded. Him and, so that him also and, happened. Uh, hi, yeah, him and Alex Dion. Um, and Yuri. They both signed. No, we talked yeah, about Yuri, you... I think, maybe. No. I don't know. We haven't recorded in quite a while, Gavin. Yeah, it really has been. Yeah. This we is what happens in the off season. Mm. Not a lot to talk about. We're just now going to start getting just the news. Get, I mean, yeah. it, this... Yeah, this news literally just got dumped on us today, or yesterday. Moving on. David Loera, he has uh, played almost every level for Orlando in the academies. He's played for the uh, youth national teams for the U.S. He has played for NC State, uh, started every single one of his appearances that he made for the Wolfpack, scored nine goals and 15 assists. He was uh, top drawers, Freshman best 11 second team, uh, all freshman third team in college soccer news, all ACC freshman uh, first team, all ACC uh, second best third team, and uh, United Soccer Coaches all region first team honors in his sophomore year. Uh, This past year wasn't great for him or the team. Uh, They only went nine and seven and three, but he still scored five and added three assists, all ACC second team, and all ACC honors for the third consecutive year. The big thing now for Orlando's sake is, you know, he's, he's played for the academy. He's played for OCB, by the way, where he actually, um, I don't know if you know this, he had a game-winning assist in one of OCB's games, and it was against Louisville City. I was going to say it wasn't this year, was it? No, God, no. Yeah. This was back in the first iteration of OCB when they were still playing. Uh, I believe it was 2016 that he had the uh, game-winning assist uh, against Louisville. Back when they were, back when they were in Melbourne. Yeah, he. It was actually in Louisville that he had the assist. I'm pretty sure the game was in Louisville, but you know. Yes, but uh, it's it's a very it, you know he he was very impressive. He he. Um, this was 2016, by the way. He was only allowed to play uh, a couple of games um, due to the rules that came from him being an academy product and still playing. Um, he played three games, 55 minutes, and notched that uh, assist that I told you about. It was actually his, um, I believe, his first ever professional game that he had that assist. So not, not, not too bad of a start for him yeah. in his professional tenure uh, to get that assist. Um, I bet, I bet you... You could not name who that player who scored the goal was to uh, win the game for Orlando. Michael Cox. Absolutely not. <laughs> Wasn't there a guy named, uh, was it a forward? It was a forward. Was it that guy whose last name was uh, like Dikwa or something? No, Dikwa was 2017. Dikwa. Hmm. Yeah, this was uh, Keegan Smith. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I never would have guessed that. Yeah. Now, if you listening at home thought, yeah, I know that guy. You're lying to yourself. <laughs> you did not know. And don't even try and tell yourself otherwise. Back on to David. He played three games for Orlando City B. The only stat he ever recorded was that game against Louisville City. He played against Toronto FC, where he played 17 minutes off the bench. And then uh, New York Red Bulls 2 uh, which was a 5-1 loss. He played a total of one minute. So his Louisville City game, he played 37. That was the most he's ever played professionally. Um, but he has gotten some professional minutes 
in OCB and USL Championship. Uh, whether he will get professional minutes with MLS team is another story. Yeah, that's going to be yeah, interesting to watch. He, he, I mean, listen, he's good. He's talented. He has been on Orlando City's radar since he was with OCB before even OCB. But like when he was playing with OCB, Anthony Pulis, I remember talking to him about David, and he's like, "Yeah, he's going to be something special in a couple years." But Jason Christ didn't see the same thing. He didn't see, like, Jason Christ's tenure was full of just inactivity when it came to the youth system. There are so many players that just kind of went by the wayside. Jason was f- fixated on winning. And that winning kind of just brushed over all of the academy players. You know, they came to train. But the only reason they were there to train was because he wanted bodies to f- help better the first team. Isn't he one of, like, the head directors of the academy in Miami now? Uh, yeah. Which is I hilarious. I find that absolutely hilarious. That and the United the United, the US U twenty three coach. Yeah. Oh, that just the irony is not lost on me. Trust yeah, me. no. A guy that absolutely is not known for developing young players is leading up uh, two major youth youth teams. Yes. Now, funny enough, NC State actually has it. It houses two other Orlando City Academy products. David Norris, who actually uh, he went to my high school. Funny enough, like Highland. Um, this was many years. I was there many years ago, so obviously we weren't there at the same time. But um, Norris is a you know s- defender by trade. Uh, played center back in his academy days, and he's he's. I don't know if he's he's necessarily MLS talent yet. You know, he's a junior as well, and he could. I could see him possibly doing something in the the MLS combine, maybe. Um, he's been part of one of a better, you know, defensive teams. Aren't they getting rid of the combine? Oh yeah, that's right. Pretty much all but doing away with the draft. Yeah. Uh, AJ Seals is another one. Um, he actually played a couple minutes for, uh, OCB as well as, uh, got some minutes with the first team, uh, in different iterations. Um, he's, uh, he's good. Mm-hmm. You know, he's only a sophomore right now at NC State. Um, he didn't. He hasn't played all that much in his tenure there. Um, he he played uh, a bit in 2018. I think he redshirted this past year. I want to say. Um, but yeah, he didn't really play any this year. Yeah, I can't really say too much about AJ, but uh, I've seen him play. He's pretty good. It's gonna be interesting with Lorea. I know we didn't. I uh, we've already gone what close to 45 minutes. So I don't want to get too much more into this, but. We didn't really discuss with Perea um, what we think his play style is going to be because that ultimately could determine how much we see of him this year. Depending on, you know, obviously the, how the rest of the midfield shakes out because they really don't have anyone there on the attacking side yet outside of Nani and a bunch of other forwards and Perea, I guess, in the midfield. But and now, Are you talking about Perea? Yeah, Perea. Yeah, Perea. Perea. Which one? <laughs> Lorea. One more time. Lorera. Oh my god. Okay. I get it that this is gonna be a fun uh, year. Oh yeah, I told you. It's it's gonna be miserable on the podcast. We're, we're we're gonna be talking about oh what a great goal from Pereira. Good pass from Pereira P- Perea. Good coaching from Pereja. Oh man, I can look forward to that. They're they this team. They're singling me out. They know I speak no Spanish. I have no ability to do Latino names, and they just keep bringing them all at me. Well, Gavin, you know what I say to that? Hmm. Uh, Aprender. Je, je parle un petit français. That's all. That's all I have. That's French. Yeah. Uh, which would have been great for Lamine, but uh, yeah. this is Spanish. Spanish. So, uh, aprender means learn. So, uh, go learn. Go learn some Spanish. And yes, Duolingo, uh, Rosetta Stone. Is that still a thing? Probably. Duolingo is pretty good, yeah. though. Yeah, it's also on your phone. Yeah. Um, learn. And yeah. my computer. Go, go learn. I'm attempting. Right. Well, uh, go do it. <laughs> and with that, you can check out me on um, the International Champions Cup Futures broadcast starting tomorrow, being Wednesday. Uh, I'm calling... Uh, 
So I think I think my first game is, um, I think PSG against uh, Vasco da Gama. I want to say. Oh. Yeah. Call on some interesting uh, interesting teams. Uh, Anyways, uh, head over to the ICC website, the International Champions Cup, to check that out. Um, you can also, and we've kind of forgotten to talk about them, but uh, they have yet to win a game yet. The Orlando Seawolves, <laughs> they have uh, they have gone zero and three in their first three games. Uh, not a great start, simply because they've they've played some very good teams thus far. They've played the Florida Tropics twice, who are three and zero and just beat the defending champions in Milwaukee, by the way. Uh, but they also Lost to the Baltimore Blast, who are the 2018 champions of MASL. Uh, Orlando is currently struggling because they're missing their top playmakers. And by that, I mean the guys that scored a total of 50 goals and 40 assists last year. They're unable to play because of visa issues. So they're missing basically their entire offense that was supposed to return from last year. So, yeah, that that's a bit to uh, overcome. They're trying to figure things out as they go. And uh, they play the Tropics again for the third time this coming Saturday in Lakeland. So look forward to that one. Do they play at the RP Funding Center there? They do. Nice. It is the RP Funding Center. It's actually not a terrible venue. It just, it'd just be nice if, if people showed up. Yeah. Which I think this, this might be, I think this is Lakeland's or Florida's first game. So... They might actually have people show up because they've re- they've basically bought the entire league. Like they bought every single best player from every other team in the league. <laughs> Don't they also own the league, the USL League Two team, the Florida Tropics? Yeah, the Lake, the Lakeland Tropics. Yeah, and they're gonna try to build that stadium. That'll be nice. Yes, yes, they will. Speaking of RP funding, if you are in Jacksonville and you happen to be listening to this, um, the Jacksonville City Council will be hearing for the RP Funding's land option agreement to build a downtown stadium in Jacksonville. So, you know, if you want to go out to that, go voice your support and uh, help grow That's soccer here, bit in, of a drive. here in Duval. Listen, if if people well, won't drive to Kissimmee to watch a Seawolves game, they won't go to Jacksonville. No, I'm saying if you're already here and you just happen oh, to be yeah, a yeah. soccer fan, you know, it's not a bad way to spend your Tuesday evening. It starts at 5, the city council, down at City Hall. That's... That's a tough one. That's a tough, tough ask. <laughs> I remember when Orlando City when Orlando City was doing that that same thing with the uh, governmental approval. You know, it was it was a really weird day. I think it was like a Wednesday afternoon, and it, the the thing went on for like three or four hours mm-hmm. with people you know voicing their opinions. And the, the vo- vote passed. Uh, I think two people voted no, and I think five voted yes or three voted yes. I don't remember the exact numbers. I remember it passed, and it was very exciting. Mm-hmm. Were you there for that? I I was in class, but mm-hmm. I was live streaming. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, I didn't. I I would not would would have wanted to be there for that, that four hours. I mean, that would have been rough. Yeah, that would be. That's probably the only reason I might not go to Mars because I don't want to sit there and they've got like a hundred. F- if you kind of if you kind of figure a time where they're gonna start winding down and you're not too far away, then you can be like, okay, I'll I'll sneak over there now. Yeah, because I mean. I was looking at the meeting agenda on online on the city website. And there's like well over a hundred items on there, so it's and it's like smacked like right Ooh. in the middle. So yeah, I, I don't blame know. you for that. Yeah. All right, that's gonna do it. We're done. You can follow us on social media. I mean, if you don't know already, just just I don't know. Look us up. The Orlando Soccer Show. It's pretty much just a meme account now. <laughs> oh yeah, pretty much. This is. I mean, this this will get us back to normality a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but you know, off seasons uh, they're tough, and so we we try and just make ourselves entertained. Either way, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>